The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly, so let's realign. Just listen and fill your mind. Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. Yes, it is Wednesday, March 13th, and so happy for you joining us just three days away from March 16th, and we are ready to start another day together with the Lord. So subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. So today we have an exciting podcast for you. We have Health is Happiness, the Bible History Word Study, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world world in this history today. Woo! Everyone, how are you doing? It is the middle of the week. It is hump day. Hope you guys have enjoyed your week thus far. We have Wednesday service tonight, so hope you get your hearts and your minds ready to receive that. Don't forget, tomorrow we have Q&A Thursday, so get those questions ready and send them to me whenever you can. And if you haven't yet, for today's video, leave a like and comment to build our community. Just super happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive. So let's get up and support each other each and every day. All right. So uh, this week's Sunday message title is, It is not possible to live fully accommodating people's hearts. Yes, and I am looking forward to today's Wednesday message. Uh, it's going to be really, really great. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm just super thankful for everyone who supported and has, uh, you know, joining us once again, making morning, the Morning Star Drive part of your daily life and faith. Uh, it's, it's, you know, by this time, by the time you guys hear this, the live stream is done, my first live stream. But for me, right now at this moment, it's still Tuesday. I still have to do the live stream a little bit later uh, tonight. I got a ton of things to do. <laughs> as funny as this sounds, guys. <laughs> like, I'm going to get my hair cut. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get my hair cut. But also... <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying this, but I've got to get my, uh, <laughs> why do I, why do I feel so self-conscious saying this, but I am going to get my eyebrows done. I don't know why it's a live stream and I feel like I need to do this. I don't know. Just leave me alone. I, why did I even say this? I'm going to get my eyebrows done. Okay. I'm just going to get them done. All right. So leave me. I don't know if I can say leave me alone because I just told you. So you guys can say something about it because I said it. So I can't say leave me alone, but I am going to say it. Yeah. So um, you guys will see uh, at the live stream whether they did it well or not. But of course, I'm a man. So I'm not going to be doing like those super thin things like that they do. Like, you know, in Japan, the guys do super thin. I, I just, that's just not my style. I just need to get it cleaned up so it doesn't look so messy and stuff. But I also do know is that when you look on camera, in most cases, you're not going to see like the eyebrows. It's like, you know what? The fun, the crazy thing is you guys are going to look back at the video to see my eyebrows now that I told you that I'm going to get my eyebrows done. Just forget it, guys. Erase it from your mind. Do not look back at it and try to look at my eyebrows and stuff like that, too. <laughs> I'm so dumb, or I'm incredibly great at marketing to, guy to make you guys watch that video once again. <laughs> but if anything, um, I, I really... I'm asking you guys to pray for the live stream, and I really hope that it uh, that this uh, channel grows. It really helps a lot of people to come into this history, change their hearts, perceptions, and minds. And, um, you know, a little bit later, there, there was some education from uh, the Internet Ministry Department in Korea, and I'm going to go over some of those notes just in, in, a, in, in a few moments. But I, I want to let you guys know that at this moment, at this time, we are not using my channel as a direct evangelism tool. Right, And there's going to be several reasons for that. And mainly it's because uh, what I've told you guys before about this too is, for instance, when I went to Taiwan, Taiwan's got 5,000 members, got churches everywhere. So if someone does direct or like uh, does like YouTube or internet ministry over there in Taiwan, wherever someone connects and says, oh, wow, I love this. How do I learn more? It's very, very easy for uh, the for the person doing like YouTube or uh, social media to connect someone to a physical church. Now, if you go into the English ministry, it's far different. It's going to span over like Australia and, you know, Europe, New Zealand, uh, all over North America. And the, the biggest issue is going to be is the West, like the foreign countries in the Western world don't have many churches. So we're going to end up having a ton of people that are going to be not from any region at all. And this is kind of why our, our next stage is going to be the online church, right? Because we need to collect these people, put them in a certain place so that they can, you know, receive, at least start to receive the word 
from where they are at that moment, it'll be more of a, it could be more of a supplementary church or it could be their home church, especially with this new generation that's more online than going offline, right? So it is not a direct evangelism tool. There is no follow-up and there's no meeting people and there's no like, you know, there's, there's nothing of that sort from this YouTube channel at the moment, right? The sole purpose at this moment, until we get more direction from Sunseam, is to educate, help people to change their perceptions, the way they think about the Bible, about the Lord's second coming, the signs that are being given. And it will, you know, it is internet ministry, which will be indirect and used to gather a following for the future, okay? Now, uh, you know, one thing I think we do need to remember is that, uh, we need to kind of broaden the way that we think about evangelism. And we can't just think about evangelism as you meet someone, you um, connect them, teach them the word directly, and then they realize the word after a year of learning or whatever, and then they come to this history, right? Because one thing that Sunseem also talks about is like having followers, having followers, like a million people who are followers to subscribe and follow these channels that we are making. Sunseem considers them kind of like a member, right? They're not full out, full-fledged members, but they are considered ours, right? Ours or people who follow us, right? So we have to even understand that even in Sunseem's eyes, having followers is a big deal too. And as long as the word is being preached, but of course, we're not preaching the core, uh, in the future, we will move, in, you know, we will, we want to move these people into the online church and such. So, um, so we just got to know that there is a future direction for us also. It's not going to just be like leaving people hanging, but we do want people to have similar thoughts to realize the same things that we realize about the word in the Bible, stuff like that too, right? So uh, I know that God has plans. Uh, when I really think about this, I have no idea what the future is. I cannot, I can't even imagine what God has planned, but I really truly feel that God is going to make things happen and he has plans for me and this channel and for all of us, right? And it's, and I think for all of us, there are plans that God has for us that we can't really imagine. The only thing we can do is to be diligent, be spiritual, walk the direction God wants us to walk. And, you know, it's, it's about the time we're living in right now. Like, it's difficult, and yeah, we're going through difficulty and almost it almost feels impossible that something great can happen. Like, think about this last year, guys. Last year, how many of us were thinking like straight up, we can evangelize tons of people. Last year was difficult, right? Now, this year is not as difficult as last year, and it but it still feels really, really hard, right? But I really feel that this is the time when big things are going to begin right? The beginning of big things, right? And the biggest thing that we need to do is to fulfill our responsibility, right? It's going to happen in our personal lives. It's all, it's going to happen in Providence. That's a guarantee, right? I, this is just a matter of, can we fulfill our responsibility? Can we really, really do what God wants us to do, right? You know, when we you know, before we're talking about the blessings we're supposed to receive for surviving and overcoming 2023, like I don't like from what I've learned in this in this history is nothing is free. And we're like, but we survived 2023. That wasn't free either. And that's true. But it doesn't mean that since we survived 2023, all of a sudden a million dollars falls out of the sky and just falls into our lap. And like, oh, wow, I'm rich. Let me just go buy a lottery ticket. Right? If anything, the blessings we're supposed to receive for surviving and overcoming 2023, they're not going to come if we do nothing. Like, we need to go out and get it done. If it's evangelism, we got to go out and evangelize. If it's lecturing, we got to go and prepare to lecture. If it's this or that, whatever it is, we've got to go out and do it. Not, blessings and all these things don't come for no reason. We need to go out and get it done, right? So, um, you know, now that we have... Um, I'm excited because internet ministry, for me, like for you guys listening to this uh, podcast, because I record this earlier on Tuesday, you guys are going to hear this and the live stream's already done. But one thing I'm super thankful for is um, uh, the internet ministry team department in uh, Korea, the online missionary education department, online, in the, uh, online ministry, the department uh, gave out some education, right? So... Um, there's a lot of questions that people have been asking, right? Like, what is, like, how, like, how important is 
online mission, like online ministry. How important is it? What is God's expectations, right? Um, you know, what is the what what does the future? What does God see in the future for online ministry? And um, you know, then there's of course questions about how to begin, how to start it, how to execute. Um, what should my expectations be? You know, those are a little bit different things, but I think the most important uh, question is going to first be is what is like how nece- what's the necessity? And this is a big question that came out. And uh, during the education, uh, the, the the two pastors that are working on it are are two good friends of mine too. And they said that the message about online ministry, do you, can you guys guess from when Sunseam started talking about online ministry? It's crazy. I didn't even know this because probably it wasn't something that it was in my mind. And, you know, at 2001, how old were... Oh, some of you weren't even born in 2001. But 2001, 88, 98, I was like uh, 23 years old, right? I was 23 years old and I was three years in Providence, right? So if you think about this, I was really, really young at the time. So, But the core content... Uh, from what Sunseam talked about online ministry, 2001, this is what Sunseam says. Please look at the future. A hundred years from now, through this gospel, it will almost dominate the world, right? Who said this? It was God speaking to Sunseam. God said that through the internet, the gospel expansion can happen naturally. So when Sunsea went out to run uh, Providence, the you know what what's the first thing that be like what as Sunsea began to run Providence, one of the things that got developed in the world was the internet. The internet begins to emerge while Sunsea is starting to run, and it's because you know the reason why God creates it is He hopes that Sunsea can use it. So in the era at the time right now. The era where the person of God is living, alive and living and preaching in the time period, God provides scientific things because of the era de- because the era develops rapidly. So even if it's just a few years, new cities and old cities will be distinguished. And previously, like uh, what, one of the examples Sansim gave, he said that there's a place called Pundang, right? And if you guys don't know uh, Pundang, Pundang is where the Lord's Church actually moved to. It's like south of uh, Seoul, right? It was a new city, but now it's an old city, right? And it's become like it's 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 fully developed, and some parts are being more developed too. But it's like a fully developed city. It's very expensive to live in too. And what Sunsim was saying is the history of province is the same. People who continue to use methods from 10, 20, or 30 years ago are like the old era, like old cities. Such people only learn old methods and cannot use new ways. They cannot lead the young new generation and the young will not follow, right? So the new generation of young people has arrived. The new era has come. Why use the old method to teach? Wouldn't the history of 2,000 years feel tired? It's the same for Providence. Using methods from 20 or 30 years ago, won't it make people feel tired? Leaders cannot use past methods. Everything must change. Different eras require different approaches. Every church must engage in online ministry. This way, the 100-member church will quickly become a thousand and and thousands then will turn to tens of thousands. This is what the Holy Trinity instructs us to do. If each person uses the internet to achieve their own 100-person internet uh, missionary, 100-person internet uh, ministry, then collectively it will become millions. Let's all engage in online ministry. And this is what... Like, this is what Sunseam already said in 2001. Isn't that incredible, guys? Like, even for me, I came in 98. So 2001, I was there. I was 20, 22, 23 years old. I don't even remember this. But God told Sunseam that through the internet, the gospel expansion can happen naturally. And God made the internet while Sunseam is living so that the gospel can be preached through that time and, and people can develop. And the part that really, you know, that that really hits home for a lot of us here is people such, you know, don't keep learning old methods, right? People who learn old methods cannot use new ways. They cannot lead the young new generation. The young will not follow, right? Stop using methods from 20 or 30 years ago. 
It's going to make people feel tired, right? Leaders cannot use past methods. Everything must change. Different eras require different uh, approaches. So, and, and God was pretty clear. Every church must engage in online ministry. Every church. And um, I, I liked how Sunstein said, if every person uses the internet, whether it's social media, and they imagine everyone gets a YouTube and you have 100 people, right? 100 new people. We're not talking people like your friends that you call to... Uh, uh, you know, your friends, hey, can you just, uh, you know, subscribe? No, no, we're talking if you get 100 new people and you have your own internet ministry, then collectively, that's millions and millions of people. And I've never thought about it that way because we don't need to have a million people each because that's really, that's, like, that's a full-time job, right? That's a full-time job. And... You know, imagine if we all just like look at your church. Imagine each person in your church has a hundred people and you only have ten people. That's a thousand person church right there. And I think that's pretty incredible if we think about it that way. Right? This is the message that's that already exists. Right? Sasib said through the internet ministry. Words can go into people's hearts and then guiding them to come to church and to worship. Both, both, look, look, look what, look what Sunseem said. Both, you know, former faith, regular churches and cults are doing it this way and have amazing development. Old methods cannot be used. We must use new methods according to different eras, right? So, we, if, if that's 2001, we know that Sunstein has been constantly talking about the online ministry, right? And of course, everyone has a desire to do it, right? Because God said it started, but uh, the biggest thing is, can we utilize it? Can we do it well, right? So what are the directions, okay? So there are, there are a lot of directions that people ask is, should we specifically mention faith or religion? Should we not? Should we di directly say that we are providence or just simply share the words? Well, how should we approach it, right? And the answer is, there are three different directions, three different directions, right? So um, this is where you'll see that where I'm looking at uh, the, the YouTube channel right now too. So there are three directions. So there is a direct missionary approach. And that's what I'm doing too, right? To directly show our beliefs, right? So in this era of advancement, using the words of this time period and the gospel, we can make people on the internet to become our members. So this can be achieved by sharing Sunstein's Proverbs or selecting specific content from Sunstein's books to put online, right? And each church will have, you know, different individuals managing online activities. And these diligent individuals often have many followers and it's necessary to impart faith to these followers, right? So this is direct, right? So this is includes teaching such as Elijah uh, and the Raven's food, Elijah and the widow, Sunstop, um, the appearance of John the Baptist as the spirit of Elijah. Moses was, you know, even though Moses was supposed to come, it resulted in the appearance of Jesus. Like these words need to be conveyed through the internet. And I think that's what, that's kind of the direction I'm taking. Now, direct, so it's direct evangelism, direct approaches, directly showcasing our faith, Sunsea's message, our words, uh, a few lessons uh, that are, uh, this aligns with direct mission, direct ministry. However, direct ministry can also be divided into two parts. One is to, clearly directly identify i am providence i am cgm kind of thing right so there's one way to do it and another way is you don't directly state that you're from providence and you just hope that your followers can accept such a faith right so like uh the example they gave is there is a missionary uh shares their experience in the spiritual world right they, they share their experience in the spiritual world. That's the YouTube channel that they have. Doesn't mention she's from Providence, but she expands her audience or anyone interested in the spiritual world. And as a result, her videos have like over five, um, her videos have over 5,000 views with at least 2,000 views each from her unique experiences in the spiritual world. Right? So she, she talks about how she learned how to do it. And she mentioned uh, about Sunstein, but not deliberately referring to him. Right. So, you know, she's she's basically breaking away from church beliefs and sharing personal experiences. So this approach is actually based on Sunseam's teachings and she has a two year plan and she wants to be more interactive and get more. You know, she wants to build the following and then share one for interaction and relationship building with people. 
right? So, and then there are these other channels that directly state that they are from Providence, directly sharing words and testifying, right? But, you know, we have to, you know, we have to be very careful in the way, the one that we want to do. You're con and they, they're, they're, they kind of give you advice. Content has to be simple and easy to understand and stuff like that too, right? So, you know, uh, this is how they want, this is kind of the education that did come out. Right, and, and I th I think it's it's very very good, right? Like at least they're answering the question. They're giving a lot of examples, um, how to do practical evangelism, right? Like there's going to be people who want to learn about faith, right? And then you may put links to official websites or attend physical meetings, and it all depends on the direction and characteristics of your channel, right? So this is direct uh direct ministry now there is an indirect ministry work and i think a lot of people are doing this so instead of unconditionally talking the faith share some good content with people uh it's kind of like living together with them allowing their lives to be elevated they'll accept you know uh they'll they'll follow you they'll accept the things that you propose um you know it's about helping people have better lives and better lives doesn't mean just like, you know, motivational talks. It also means like fashion, fashion and sports and this and that, having a better community, right? So these people, it's a lot easier to gather crowds here. And it's, it's, it's easy to gather a large number of members in just one year, right? So think about this. In the past, in the old ways, some pastors would spend 30 years gathering 300 church members to establish a church, right? And if I think about this, I spent three years on my Espresso channel, which is now the Rebel Pastor, right? I spent 30, uh, I spent three years on that and there's 5,000 subscribers, right? But some pastors spend 30 years gathering 300 church members just to establish a church. You see that it's, it's so different right now right they gave an example of an old lady who shares her life through the internet and she shares excellent ideas to help everyone with life problems and she spreads the gospel in this way and within a few years she has seventy thousand followers right so she basically turned her home into a church to convey the gospel right and we can gather online followers through some interesting topics and slowly provide them with faith right so this is something that a lot of people can do right so you know uh, on, just gradually instill Proverbs. You know, I, I think that just posting a proverb, like say on Instagram, that's a little bit harder, I think, because then you're looking for a specific crowd, but people are looking for a face. They are. They look for a face that they can trust, right? So um, that's the reason why I don't put my face on MSD, because if you saw it, you wouldn't trust anything I said. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a bad joke in the middle of this education, <laughs> right? So... Uh, so this indirect way is more gradually putting faith into them, helping them in their lives, elevating their lives in some way, and then slowly putting like faith into their life, right? And that is indirect ministry, indirect, right? So in, on the surface, you're not directly mentioning faith, but provide sharing and information needed in life. And then gradually there'll be opportunities to share faith and bring them to church and stuff like that too. So that's indirect missionary, right? So, you know, uh, you know, one, one thing I, Sunsteam did say is if we're going to go into people's lives and help them, we have to be standing at a higher level of life to help them. We have to be at a higher level, right? So, you know, we need to be those that can help people so that they will be helped. And by doing so, let's say out of 100 people, let's say 50 will share this channel with other people, right? And as long as they're not opposing you or opposing Providence, this is... Sunseep said, this is kind of a church member. This is kind of a church member. When the time is right, you'll gradually introduce words. And for, you know, uh, we have to understand, like, it's not easy to cultivate this. You know, we, we the way that internet ministry sounds, it makes it sound so easy, but it's not. Right? It's not. It's challenging. And it takes devotion. It takes diligence. It takes consistency and persistence. Right? So... Uh, things you can do, like if you understand, it's like it's not easy. But think about this. Look about think about a casual activity like walking or jogging, right? It's done by ninety percent of the population. Even grandmas and grandpas can do that. It's for their health and stuff too. But you have to think about faith is the same thing, right? Don't try to turn them into faith athletes. Okay, and I think that's something that we have to think about also when in church, even right now. We're not trying to make people into special forces, into the best of the best of the best. 
That's not what our, you know, that's not, you know, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people in their life, right? And people are going to grow at their own pace and their own speed. So when we're introducing faith, it should be approached like promoting healthy leisure activities, encouraging them to participate, right? So is the goal of online ministry to make them Providence members? And Sunseem actually didn't say it, say it that way, right? He, he didn't say it that way, right? Because many people are always asking, well, how do I connect online individuals to the word, right? But today, it's clear through Sunseem's letter that even if faith is not explicitly mentioned, encourage them to follow. You can still be considered a form of cultural member, which is also valuable, Okay. And, you know, we need to, of course, we need to research how to teach the word, how to teach faith, what it requires, time and effort. And, you know, becoming a promise member takes time. Like even for us at, in the church, it takes time for us to really become a member. And it involves many process, a lot of people, a time and effort, right? It's kind of the same as building a relationship with a person. It takes more than a year of investment, right? How can someone become a member after just one or two interactions? We need to invest time invest effort and then gradually bring them into the fold right so we have to realize that it takes time and it's a process using the internet to connect and attract followers is a result of online ministry work okay and um, you know everyone uh, even headquarters now acknowledging this internet ministry too so since you've already mentioned that you can invite them to you know invite them out for meals whatever it is invest in them in this way but it's just you know it's it's just it's not just about managing a channel to teach faith but managing a channel to teach life so many followers of your channels and then you know some some will become members and it's also a form of online ministry work too so even if you manage the channel without any faith content many of Sunseem's words and proverbs can still help people in their lives all right now if you guys want to contribute, how can we do that? Okay, how can you contribute? So, uh, if if you're not doing online ministry, one of the ways that you guys are doing really well right now is regularly engaging. And the reason this is because regularly engaging yields results and data, right? And it results in progress for a channel too, right? So to support internet ministry work, right? Uh, is of course, if you're doing internet ministry, it's not a casual thing. It takes planning and strategy and everything else too. So, uh, like, there's like a minimum threshold for a blogger uh, or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, right? So if you you know there's there's like these standards and thresholds that you need to do in order for you to make a real uh, like following or a real channel, right? And you know. Uh, if you cannot manage these tasks yourself, then financial support is also great, right? This is another excellent method of online ministry is financially supporting these uh, these channels and stuff, right? And like, it's not just about providing financial support just because you lack the skills to do social. Like, this, this is the education. Providing financial support just because you lack the skills to do it yourself, it's not really about that. Instead, you have to realize that having financial backing in support of internet ministry is also crucial. Like, it takes money. Like, I'll tell you guys right now, even for the things that I'm doing for um, the channel also, it takes money. It just does. It's just, it's that's part of life. So in the world of the internet, um, the thing you have to understand is you can either do it financially or, of course, when you look at the, like, say, for me, YouTube, there's a YouTube algorithm that no one knows and it keeps changing, right? And, you know, it's not like if you just do something, it just automatically pushes up through the algorithm. Your articles, your videos, your blogs, whatever it is, it must become popular before they can gain traction, Right? So whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, or a blog, you need a high exposure rate for your content to succeed. And this is what attracts more followers. So the algorithm itself has never been publicly disclosed, right? It's, it's very, very complex, right? They don't want people to exploit it. So no one knows the principles behind the algorithm. But there are some things that have been studied, right? So um, the length of viewing time is important, Right. So if I have a video that's like 30 minutes and you watch for 50 percent, like 15 minutes, that's a huge thing. Right. 
So like watching for 50%, there's going to be a point system where, oh, it's watch more. So that's why I would say that, yeah, if you can't join my uh, live stream, at least watch it later because it's going to be posted online anyways. And when you post it, when, I, when, when it's posted online, watch it and just let it run through. Right, or you can stop it and then watch more later, but r watch as much as you can. Right, and then another thing that's important is saving the video. Right, so there's like watch later or save the video, and there's also sharing. So you know, if you have, if you see the video that I make or whatever, um, not MSD. Right, MSD you can share with other people who are uh, members, but for the Rebel Pastor channel. Just share it. Share the link. Share it with someone else so that they can they can watch it too. And just tell ask people what they think about it also. And that also helps the algorithm. Right? So you guys do know that nah, I'm not I'm doing indirect, like I'm doing direct evangelism as I'm sharing the word, but I'm not directly stating Providence CGM, this type of stuff. But you can send it to people, send it to your parents, send it to people who have faith, send it to your friends and see what they think about it too. Right? So the number of shares and saves also makes uh is, is very important. Right? So uh, so when you see when you see my video, if you want to help out, uh, watch it through and um, uh, and watch it through doesn't mean all at once because if you if you really are going to watch it, watch it and then you know pause it and then watch other parts and then pause it and keep watching it. That that way is okay too, but also share it, right? Save and share. Those are two big S's. Save and share, and then the algorithm will decide this is good material or not and pro and promote the content even further. Right. So that is something I do think is very, very important. And of course, uh, you know, there's a click through rate. Basically, once you see it, just click it. And that's a that's a that's an important thing that uh, the algorithm's looking at also. Right. So spend time watching the videos or sharing them, save them. Right. And then, uh, yeah, that would be a really, really big help. Right. So those of you who are not doing Internet ministry, I like the examples they gave. How can we support number one financially, number two uh, and or you can spend time watching the video, save and share them, right? And those are going to be like the, the the things that you guys can do to help out. Okay, so you know, let's let's all try to contribute in a way um, that uh, you know that we can do it together. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm just really thankful that uh, this education is coming out too. It's something that I will uh, look forward to in the future also. Okay, so this is uh, the internet ministry education. Hope it's something that helps you guys out too. And like I said, I'm starting the live stream. You guys are already see it out right now. Click it, save it, and share it, and send it to your friends and stuff like that too. Share is like you can um, you can uh, when you share. Wait a second. Let me just check one thing here. What does it mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, this is kind of funny. I don't even know what it means to uh, save. Right. It's kind of odd, isn't it? because I've never saved anything before, right? So if there is, uh, let's take a look here. All right, so let's let's take a look at something here. I'm, I'm actually looking into one of my channels. Oh, because so there, there is a share, perfect. Right, so um, right below the video, there's a thing that called share, and then um, you can share it to like a WhatsApp. You can share it to Kakao. You share it to Line. Share it here and there, and I think that's that's a really really good one too. And of course, I need to post it on my, I need to post it on my Instagram and stuff like that too, so people can click in the link and stuff like that. Also, I, I think it's very very important. Also, right, very very important. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, very very grateful. Okay, so, and then, oh, what's the save one, though? There's download. Oh, there is a save. There is a save. Perfect. Okay, so there is a save. So, below the channel, like, below the video, you're going to see the share. And then to the right, you'll see three three dots. You click the three dots and you click save. And that's another way to do it, too. So, guys, if you're able to do it, uh, I would be very appreciative and hoping that these channels grow more and more. All right. So there it is, guys. That is today's, um, you know, that's, that's the education on online ministry. Hope it's something that you guys can really help out. Like even right now, guys, you guys can go into my um, Rebel Pastor channel, go into some of those videos you like and just go and save them and share them to some people too if you can. Okay. 
Okay, so there it is. Uh, that is today's um, first segment. Hope you guys really enjoyed it. Right after this, we have the Bible history uh, word study. So hope you guys will enjoy this. But let's first get into uh, the first break of the day. From falling, I feel your warm embrace, breathing life into my withering spirit, pouring out your love and grace. So I think to myself, I'll repay you. Ooh, oh. You pulled me out of darkness so many thousands of times. You gave me strength and courage Everything that I need in life Look at all the countless blessings I'll repay you Ooh, oh. Even if the world forsakes you And they misunderstand What it means to be in providence Holding God's truth in our hands We fulfill the greatest history God's will and highest love All the wondrous miracles you've shown Only here in Providence Providence Push forward, we'll run Till the end With our solid faith We'll repay you with all our heart, will and life. Now the seals are broken, the treasure's now revealed You've shared his highest wisdom, valued secrets of how to live Looking back at all the memories, I'll repay you Ooh, oh. Even if the world forsakes you and they misunderstand what a blessing it is that you're here Acting with God hand in hand We've received the greatest rapture We've gained eternal joy This is God's final history Never will it be destroyed Providence will shine our brightest light For your dreams, your word fills the earth that will preach Gain all that you want To achieve Even if the world forsakes you And they don't understand We're more than proud to be here Holding God's truth in our hands We fulfill the greatest history God's will and highest love your words, your precious providence We'll cherish it to the end Providence We'll stand till the end Providence We'll live with our God Providence Love God with our hearts Will and life All right, so let's get into today's word study. And of course, we have Bible history word study every single Wednesday. Hope you guys have been enjoying this. We have moved already 11 chapters in. We're starting with Genesis chapter 12 today, all right? So Genesis chapter 12, we're gonna start with the call of Abram. Of course, we know him as Abraham. Later, his name was changed to the father of all nations. 
So uh, when we look at Genesis chapter 12, it's quite interesting how Abram was called from the land of Haran, right? So we know that Abraham was an idol worshiper. And uh, he comes from the genealogy of uh, his ancestors is Eber, and that's why they consider him in a Hebrew, someone of Eber's lineage, okay? And yeah, he was a fervent idol worshiper, very diligent. Uh, and when he was called by God, he got up and left his family to Canaan, which is a huge deal back in those days because you're supposed to live with your family your entire life kind of thing. And, you know, that, that in itself was a huge leap of faith to leave the house of his father. But God didn't just tell Abram to leave. He also made a promise to him that he would become a great nation. Now, there's something you need to remember is Abram is the restoration of Adam. So what Adam, uh, what Adam failed in the Garden of Eden uh, Abram needed to restore. He needed to set the condition for history to begin, right? History needed a new beginning and it had to start properly and Abram had to set the conditions to, to start the history of God that already failed twice at the time of Adam and Noah. So what we know of Abram is that he was from Ur, the land of the Chaldeans, and he was asked to start a new nation in Canaan, right? He took everything he had, also his nephew Lot, uh, went with him too. And, you know, one thing we do need to realize is like Abram, the history of faith has to start with the father of faith, right? So remember that Abram turned to Abraham because he set the conditions and he allowed history to actually begin because, you know, we know later on he even sacrifices, you know, he's uh, willing to sacrifice his own, his his son too, right? But what we do know here is like, okay, if this is the case, so what's the next thing we need to understand? Well, the next thing we need to understand is, is that, remember, through his children, he had Isaac and uh, Ishmael. Isaac became the one that set the condition for the individual. Then he had a son, Jacob, which set, who set the condition for the family, right? So he had the 12 children of Israel, right? And then... Joseph sets the condition for the nation and saves the nation becoming the prime minister of Egypt. So that lineage becomes such a huge thing that Abraham sets the condition for history to begin. And then three generations down, they're being blessed and they set the conditions for the rest of history to begin. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So we'll go into verse 10. It says, uh, at this point, at, at one point, there was a, a like a severe famine in the land and it forced Abram to go to Egypt. Now, we know how the story goes, too, is his wife, Sarai, was beautiful and he was scared that people would kill him for her. So he made a ruse and told people that, no, 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 she's my sister. Well, she was a half sister, different mother, but same father. And that's kind of what was cultural back then. Right. So a lot of people do ask is, is this considered the right thing to do? To, to kind of hide that from people that, that Sarai was his wife, right? Now, Sunseem said that the most important thing at this time, that Abraham did the right thing because he was the man of mission. And if the man of mission dies, history is destroyed. And that's why protection of the man of mission was the most important part. And Sarai also knew this. Right? Can you imagine if the right person is there, the man of mission is there, his, but then he dies because he's not wise and how he's dealing with like foreigners and such, and then history breaks again. And this is why it was so important to protect Abraham. Okay? Now, even though, you know, even though it meant that people would try to take his wife and defile her and make her their own wife, it was worth the risk because it was protecting the man of mission. Now, the pharaoh of Egypt tries to take Sarai as his wife. But then, of course, him and his entire household get struck with the disease. And, of course, he, he realizes, oh, my gosh, Abram, why did you do? Why did you lie? Right? And then, of course, Abram's like, dude, I'm, I'm scared. Like, this is not even my country. And uh, what if people kill me because of the beauty of my wife? Right? So then that, you know, then the 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 Pharaoh sends him off. Now chapter 13 comes along and Abram becomes super wealthy. And this is where Lot, his nephew, decides to go elsewhere because the land was too small for both their flocks. Now Abram gave the choice to Lot of where he wanted to go. And Sunstein said that 
Because Abram is the man of mission, whichever side Lot chose, it didn't matter because God would bless whichever side Abram went. But of course, Lot was a little bit more physical. He looked at the side that was greener and um, Abram went to the side uh, of Canaan. Okay, chapter 14. Uh, there's a war that ensues between kings of the land. And of course, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were part of this war. And in the end, they lost. And Lot was taken, his entire family, everything that he owned was taken away by the victors. Abram heard the news and with 318 men, he went and he destroyed and saved his nephew, right? And of course, um, the kings banded together with him and they got, they got back everything they wanted. And uh, interesting thing at the very end, uh, Abram was offered like so many riches from these kings. But, but he's like, you know, I refuse to take anything because I, I, I don't want anyone to say that I became rich because of you guys. Right. So very, very wise man. We go to verse 18. And this is very, very interesting because this is the first time we hear about this high priest. And I'm sure you've heard about him. His name is uh, Melchizedek. OK, Melchizedek. We're like, what? He's supposed to be the king of Salem. But he was also the priest of the God most high. He blessed Abram and then Abram gave a tithing to him, gave him a tenth of everything. So here's like, who the heck, like this is a very difficult, uh, like since we've never talked about Melchizedek either. Melchizedek, he commands like a disproportionate amount of importance in like the history of redemption, salvation compared to the amount of times he's spoken about. Like his name, Melchizedek, literally means king of righteousness. And he ruled over Salem Salem, which also uh, is shalom, which also means like peace, harmonious peace. And it's interesting because what he offers Abram is bread and wine, which is very symbolic of like the communion after Abram's victory over his battle uh, when he defeats his enemies. But then Abram also tithes Melchizedek, a tenth of everything, reinforcing this like spiritual significance. <clears throat> It's so interesting because there's very few places in the Bible where Melchizedek is actually talked about, but he plays such a significant role. Like, for instance, in Psalms 110, like Psalms 110 talks about the future king, like the future king, like honor, power, authority, all of these things, right? Than any human king before him. And he sits at Yahweh's right hand, right? The highest honor, right? And basically, it's very interesting because when you get to verse 4, it talks about this king, this messianic figure, isn't only a king, but it says in verse 4, he's also a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He comes up again. I don't know why. In, like, in the New Testament too, <clears throat> in the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek comes up again, like his profile, how great he is. And Melchizedek is talked about like this pre-incarnate Christ figure. Like he's eternal, having no father or mother, resembling the son of God. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. That's how big, eternal, no father or mother, resembling the son of God. And then in verse 4, it says, Abraham's tithing to Melchizedek also confirms his greatness. You go even further in, in, in Hebrews chapter 7. It says, following Melchizedek, Jesus is the true king of righteousness who lived the perfect life no human, human being could. Jesus is also the true king of peace. Peach is Shalom, Salem, right? Which Melchizedek was uh, the king of, who came to earth to bring peace through his sacrificial death and resurrection. Jesus is also a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Like I said, Sunsim hasn't talked much about him at all. But the references to him in the Bible are crazy important. And yet there are so few verses. So that's something that I find very, very interesting in chapter 14 is the beginning of seeing where Melchizedek comes from. Chapter 15, okay? And this is where God promises uh, Abraham a son. The promise would be sealed by a covenant between God and Abram. Now, 
the reason, like when we when we look at how he makes a covenant in verse nine, he says, "Get me a heifer, which is like a like a baby cow, I think, a baby cow or bull, uh, a goat and ram, all have to be three years old, and a dove and pigeon, so two birds." Okay, and what they have to do is they cut the animals in half and they separate the two on the ground and you have to walk through the middle between the two halves. Okay, so why is this uh, so significant? Well, this is kind of how a covenant was made. So if you guys go into the original language of, I believe, the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew of the word covenant just means to cut. So literally making a covenant with God means to cut. So you make a sacrifice and you cut those animals in half and you have this symbolic passage through, through be, between the two halves as a symbol of this is a covenant between me and God, right? So remember, this is a covenant of God promising Abram a son, okay? But what we do know is in verse nine that he does not split the birds. Now, like I said, if the birds are not cut, it is not a perfect or complete covenant, right? He only cuts the big animals, but not the small ones. Now, we know that the covenant wasn't perfect. And how do we know that it wasn't perfect or there was a problem? If you look at, Sunsi talks about verse 11 and 12 as the hints that it wasn't a perfect, uh, it wasn't a perfect covenant, Verse 11 says, birds of prey came down on the carcasses. So you split them in half and basically saying vultures, unclean vultures or crows or ravens came down. So there's one is, it's, it become, and these birds are considered unclean. So unclean animals touched the carcasses. So there's another one. There's first sign you know that there was a problem with, the, uh, with his sacrifice. The second problem with his sacrifice and covenant was in verse 12, you see that Abraham fell asleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came down on him, which is not a good thing. Thick and dreadful is not good. It should have been like white fluffy clouds and peace and joy and love came down upon him, but it wasn't. It was thick and dreadful. So how do we know? Then, then we know that there was a punishment in verse 13 that Abraham's descendants would be punished for this incomplete covenant for 400 years in a land not their own. And we all know that this is the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. So we know that it was actually Abram's fault. This happened. It was a punishment for not having a complete covenant, right? So Sassim talks about why there was such a punishment. And it's because, you know, if, if well, all it was was Abraham didn't make a perfect covenant, just didn't cut the two birds in half. And some people would complain that this is not fair. And that's why, you know, uh, like, why should these descendants be punished for what Abram did, right? And the interesting thing about human beings, like Sunseem talks about, is that people are, you know, are kind of hypocritical or unjust in the way that they deal with things, right? Like, for instance, do you think anyone would complain if Abram did a complete and perfect covenant and they were blessed, they didn't, like, it's, a, it's the exact same concept. Just as they didn't do anything to get the 400 years of slavery, that was, that was Abram's fault, which means that they got something they didn't deserve. But if he did it perfectly and they kept receiving blessings because of what Abram did, not what they deserve, but because of what Abram did, do you think anyone would be complaining? No one would complain, right? It's kind of like this. Um, think about it as getting inheritance for your parents. Imagine your, your parents leave you $10 million. Would you take it? And the answer is absolutely. But what if they left you $10 million in debt? Would you take it or complain? And if you really think about it, it's the same concept we're dealing with, right? The same concept is, People would take the 10 million they don't deserve, but they wouldn't take the 10 million debt that they don't deserve, right? Why would you give me 10 million in debt? I didn't do it. I didn't deserve this, right? But the reality is you deserve, you don't deserve it. Both you don't deserve. So if you really believe in the concept, in the principle of I don't take anything I don't deserve, that means not only will you not take the 10 million in debt, you will not take the 10 million inheritance either, right? So if you, you know, we got to be honest with ourselves and truthful too. Then, you know, this is why one of the great things what God put is installed as a principle is um, people can help or people can pass on to the next generation. 
right? That's why like Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, it shows that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 shows uh, that like you will like chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, that if you do well, then your generations will be blessed for a thousand generations. But if you sin, you'll be punished three to four, right? So it's something where, yeah, both things happen. Right, God's principle is you get, you you can give to your ancestors. He doesn't talk about good or bad. It's just you give, right? What it's your responsibility. So if you give good, your ancestors get good, and if you leave bad, then your ancestors get bad, right? God's not looking at what is good and bad. It's just the principle itself is you're able to give to the next generation, right? And the reason why this is so good is because this is how we're able to develop in life. Your our ancestors, right, are the ones that set the conditions or our ancestors set a foundation, whether it's faith, whether it's technology, whether it's science. And from all those things, we build on top of that foundation. And this is why we're able to advance that much more, right? The, the problem is, is if you do evil, it gets worse and worse and worse. Or if you do good, it gets better and better and better. Right, So it is a blessing and a curse, but God didn't make it as a blessing or a curse. It was made, right? Uh, it was made for the principle itself that hopefully that people would just be doing their responsibilities and doing good, which means that it's not good or bad. The principle is neutral. It's about human beings. They pass on depending on whether they are good or bad. Okay, so that's why, you know, this, this is it's, it's not a good or bad thing. It's what we leave behind. Now, a second question that um, Sunseem actually answers, he says, why did Abram make such a mistake? Why didn't he just cut the birds? And Sunseem said that the, the answer is in Matthew 5, 23, 24, and Jesus answered it. Now, you might not think that there's an answer here, but this is the answer. In Matthew 5, 23, 24, it's, Jesus says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Now, here's the thing. Why did Jesus say this? Is because, think about it. If you're about to give something to God, give an, a, a, a full, complete, 100% offering to God, but you have these, you know, like you had a fight with a friend, with your parents, your brother, sister, whatever it is, right? And it's on your mind. What's going to happen is you're not going to give a complete offering because you have something else that's weighing on your heart, something else that's weighing on your mind, right? And it, it, it will make us, it, help, it brings us to make mistakes. And that's what really happens in life too. What happens in our lives all the time is because of the other things that are going on, we start to make mistakes in other things. Like in your school. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> imagine your parents are going through a divorce. You, your, your grades begin to fail because you start making these simple mistakes you never would have made in the past. Right? So what does this have to do with Abram? Well, Abram's about to, you know, give a gift at the altar and do a covenant with God. So who has something against him? Who is he fighting with? Well, who else is there to fight with but his wife? And since he was talking about the reason why he made this small mistake was he was arguing with his wife. She was really, really upset and they were fighting. Guess what they were fighting about? Well, think about it. What is this covenant for? God promises. Like this is the one thing that was on Abram's mind is like, hey, God, are you serious? I'm really going to have a child? He was fighting with his wife. He was fighting with his wife so much that when he asked God, like, I, how do I know for sure you're going to give me a child? I need to know for sure. And God's like, let this covenant be between you and me. This will be a sign you're going to have a son. Right? He was fighting with Sarai. And because of that, he failed in this offering. Key point is, don't fight with your wife. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Women are all the problems. No, I'm just kidding. But that, that was the, the actual issue that he was dealing with was he was fighting with his wife as, about having a child and not having a child. And you'll see even later, because we're, we're done here. From, from next week, we'll go into Genesis 16. She was so desperate that she even gave her maidservant Hagar. 
right? That even after being promised by God, she couldn't hold on. She, she thought it was impossible that she got her maidservant to sleep with Abram to have a child, right? So you'll see that this issue is an ongoing issue that even with a covenant with God, uh, there was still fighting and this stuff going on, okay? So we'll end it here. And this is Genesis 16. And we'll end it at this part and then we'll go into, yeah, we'll end it at the end of Genesis 15. We'll go into Genesis 16 from next week. Okay. So there it is, guys. That is today's Bible history word study. Hope you guys really enjoyed this. Uh, if there's any other questions or anything else, please leave it in the comments below. Okay. Uh, so uh, today is Health is Happiness and we're going to go also into Dr. Abe. He's going to talk about some major organs. Uh, and today he's going to talk about the spleen. I believe it's part one. I do believe it's part one and part two will be next week. Let me just do a quick double check to make sure that this, um, to, to see that there is the spleen for next week. Uh, next week is going to be, uh, oh no, no. Spleen is only one day. Next week is going to be the liver. The liver has two parts. So today is the spleen. So I hope you guys will really enjoy this. Uh, but first let's get into the last music break of the day. <music>
Okay, so let's get into our final segment of the day, which is uh, Health is Happiness. And today, Dr. Abe over there in Australia is going to do uh, an episode on the spleen. Hope you guys really enjoyed this. Get educated about our health, and it's something that uh, we can put into action too. All right, so please welcome all the way over from Australia. This is Dr. Abe with Health is Happiness. Hi, everyone. Dr. Abe here from Melbourne, Australia. And welcome to episode four of our growing series on the body's organs. Today, let's discuss the spleen. So the spleen is a bean-shaped organ that sits in the upper part of the left side of the abdomen. It's actually protected by the rib cage, in particular the ribs 9, 10 and 11 on that left side. So what's the function of the spleen? Well, think of the spleen as a bloodstream filter. So its main function is essentially to screen the bloodstream for debris, for bugs and infections, and also for dying red and white blood cells. So there are two components to the spleen. There's the red pulp and there's the white pulp. Let's discuss the red pulp first. The red pulp is responsible for recycling old red blood cells. In particular, it's very efficient at recycling the iron component within those red blood cells. The red pulp also stores our platelets. Now, our platelets are also part of the red blood, the bloodstream. There's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Those are the three main components. And the platelets specifically are used for the clotting process. So whenever there's a bleed from anywhere in the body, they essentially get to that bleeding blood vessel and form a plug to stop it. Now, the white pulp is a little bit more complicated. It's essentially an organized collection of specific immune system cells. So when we are infected by a bug, with time, debris of that bug can be detected by immune system cells sitting in the white pulp of the spleen. Once they are detected, those immune system cells are activated and it is here where we bulk produce a lot of the antibodies that can then fight that specific infection. Okay, so how can we investigate uh, if something's wrong with your spleen? Well, there isn't actually any specific blood test that we can check on directly for spleen function, but instead we sort of have an inkling that your spleen might not be working well, particularly if you're having constant recurrent bacterial infections again and again and again, and particularly we see this in our pediatric or our young patients. If that is the case, that's when we start to think that there might be something wrong with the spleen. Now, what kind of diseases are there of the spleen? Well, there are three main conditions that I'd like you to know about. The first is trauma. Now, this is the big one. The spleen, as we spoke about, receives a lot of the blood supply. And we know that the ribs lie just on top of the spleen. So as you can imagine, in any patient who's had a major injury to that left side of the upper abdomen or to those ribs, a fractured rib, those can actually point and puncture the spleen and lead to a massive blood loss. This is a surgical emergency. The next condition to be aware of is splenomegaly, and that just means enlargement of the spleen. This is often a consequence of liver disease, and we will link the two in next week's episode that I'll be doing on the liver. But it can also be caused by blood cancers or specific viral infections known as infectious mononucleosis. The final condition is related to immune thrombocytopenic purpura. It's a long term, but it's also known as ITP. Now, what this is, it's an autoimmune disease. So that means that the body attacks itself. In the disease, antibodies form against those platelets in the bloodstream that we spoke about. So those those antibodies attack the platelets. If you can destroy the platelets, that means you'll have poor blood clotting, and that means you'll have excessive bleeding. So now this is a disease spectrum. So some patients might only have minor bleeds and others may actually have catastrophic bleeds. And so one of the final options in a spectrum of treatment also for the disease is to remove the spleen surgically. So we actually don't need a spleen to live. But if it is removed, it does mean that you are at increased risk of infections, particularly certain bacterial ones, Because remember, we no longer have that white pulp. So in that event, a patient does have to have their spleen removed. This is called a splenectomy. 
And what it means for the patient is that they will have to take extra protective measures to fight infections. So firstly, they will need to be fully up to date on all their vaccinations so as to prime their immune systems for those potential bacterial infections. And secondly, they may be put on to lifelong antibiotics as a preventative mechanism. All right then, I hope this has given you a few insights onto the spleen and its functions. I look forward to speaking to you more in the next episode. And thank you so much, Dr. Abe, for a wonderful, even though it's a rerun, wonderful episode on the spleen and something I do hope that all of us uh, will take into consideration in our life and our daily health. Okay, so everyone, enjoy your Wednesday. Have an awesome day. I uh, hope you guys have a great, great service tonight, too. And we'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this.